ahead and get started. So Rachel, would you mind hitting the record button? Got it. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and get started. So alternative careers with a science degree. So as a breakdown for today's session, first, we'll be going over some general overview of the resources for exploring alternative careers. We'll go over some of the guiding principles that uh, we have thought up of, of what it means to pursue alternative careers when you do have a STEM degree. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll be going over some career profiles of individuals who have had different um, careers that they pursued after getting a STEM degree from the University of Maryland. And then we'll conclude with the panel from some of our guest visitors who are with us today, who are also alumni from UMD. So exploring alternative careers. So we'll go over some general uh, advice and um, philosophies that guide how we encourage folks to go about this process. For those of you who have a STEM degree or are um, and are looking to get into a career that maybe not be STEM focused, or you're trying to get into a STEM career, but that it's different than the one that maybe your major is in. So a couple of things to keep in mind. I think the one thing that we try and um, tell people first and foremost is that having a particular major doesn't consign you to a specific career path. I know that for a lot of people, sometimes, you know, for example, if they think that they're majoring in biology, then that means that they have to become a doctor or they have to go into a research career or that if they're going into computer science, they need to become like a computer scientist or a software developer or a software engineer. And that's not always necessarily the case. Um, People who decide on a major, like the whole idea of a major is for you to just get specialized training in one particular thing, but it's not necessarily indicative of what the only possibilities you might have as a career moving forward. And so with that idea, changing careers is like completely normal. I think on average, a recent study has shown that adults um, around our age will change jobs very frequently, I think about six to 10 times on average. And so it is very common. I think people change their majors very frequently when they're in college. And just once you leave college, it's also very common for people to change careers and jobs. So I do want to normalize that process for all of us so that you know you recognize that you probably aren't the only person who's going through this whole process of changing careers or jobs multiple times um, once you graduate college. Another thing that I see come up very frequently for um, STEM folks in particular is the idea of salary. Um, I think we all have this assumption or general understanding that, you know, for STEM careers in general, like salary is typically higher on average compared to some other careers you might think of. But as important as salary is, it doesn't have to be the sole reason that you decide to pursue a certain career. I think it's also important that you, again, consider what your personal interests are. Um, you consider what skill sets that you personally have that you could contribute to a career that you would be good at doing. And everything in between that, like being able to balance your own interests with what skills you have, um, what your personal circumstances are as it relates to like starting a family, um, moving, being able to travel, all of those things can also factor into the type of career you might want to pursue in the future as some uh, jobs or careers might have more flexible um, lifestyles in terms of what you can do outside of work compared to certain other careers. So that is also something you might want to keep in mind as you decide on alternative careers to pursue. And then lastly, you can also think about like what your values are and what contributions you can make with your career. So I think, again, this kind of ties back with the last point beyond like salary being the most important thing for uh, people pursuing STEM careers is that, you know, you can also think about what sort of impact you want to make um, to others, for example, when you are in a career. Um, I know one example that I can think of off the top of my head is that there are some people who do decide to pursue um, STEM related careers, but perhaps not in like the most traditional of settings, like in a research lab or in a hospital or for like, um, like an engineering company, for example. Um, 
there are some people who might want to pursue their work through like nonprofit organizations or through government positions. Um, so sort of the focus of their work is not concentrated towards like private entities, but they may want to decide to do work that contributes to others or to the public. Um, so those are some other ways that you can think about, you know, how or who do you want to serve as it relates to the types of careers that you want. So those are some of the things that you might want to keep in mind as you consider some of the advice that you hear our panelists give today and through the profiles we present later on during today's presentation. So now just to go on to some tangible strategies as to where you can look for specific careers. Um, the one that I recommend to folks most often is ONET, um, which uh, has an online assessment that you could take. I think it'll ask you questions based on a wide variety of criteria, including like Holland's like big five personality inventory. It'll also ask you to weigh certain things like, um, you know, salary, for example, your like how much education you need to pursue a certain career, um, the flexibility of the work that you'd be able to do. So I'll ask you a lot of different questions to weigh what careers might be best for you. And then it'll identify some careers that align with your personal interests, uh, what desired lifestyle you might wanna have and more. So I think that would be a good place for you to start to get some general overview of to, as to what careers might be good for you to start looking at. And then what you can do is if you find some careers that are really suitable for you based on that assessment, you can go ahead and look at the Occupational Outlook Handbook, which is provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, of the US government. And so you can find specific careers by occupation cluster or field of degree. Um, and then you can also look at the career outlooks for that based on how much that particular occupation is growing in the United States, what the salary outcome is like. It'll also say what the recommended education level is for pro uh, professionals who have that sort of career. So that can provide you, again, a nice overlook as to what sort of careers can look like on the more um, tangible side of things in terms of uh, how you can attain that career and then what sort of benefits you can get from it. And then lastly, the one that I think is slightly less uh, well-known among students are vault guides. So for those of you who are students at the University of Maryland, you have free access to vault.com, which provides a really um, useful repository of guides that you can look at based on industry trends and um, occupational outlook, similar to the occupational outlook handbook provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can access the vault guides through careers for TERPs. Um, there should be a section, I think, on the left-hand margin of the screen on the homepage once you log in. So you'll be able to log on to vault.com and look at their uh, their um, industry guides that will break down careers by industry. And you can see the different types of positions that people can hold even within a specific industry, which I think can be really useful if you're one of those people who are interested in perhaps like staying within your specific industry or major, but you're not looking to go down like the same uh, generic say, or um, traditional paths that people might want to have uh, with your particular major. But that being said, it can be useful for anyone who's interested in learning more about careers within majors, uh, within uh, majors that you are interested in or majors that you're um, outside of what you're currently studying. So I think that can be a very good in-depth guide as opposed to the Occupational Outlook Handbook, which provides more of a general overview. So what are some additional things to consider um, once you sort of identify um, you know, the general direction you want to go in for the careers that you want to have? I think that probably the most important thing as it relates to your employability is the skills needed for the job. Um, I think it's one thing to have the passion or desire to do a certain job, but it's another thing to make sure that you have the requisite skills needed to be successful in that job. So one important thing to consider is what are the transferable skills that um, you have from prior work experiences or for your major that can then be used to apply for positions that you are interested in going into. I think one example that I've um, had recently when I was speaking with the student is someone who was interested in doing health policy work and that student was interested um, or is currently a biology major. So they felt like they didn't have a lot of um, 
direct experience doing policy work. But if you think about the nature of policy work, for example, there's, um, there's a lot of research, right, that probably goes around trying to develop effective policies. Um, you probably need to have good writing and research skills in order to do that work. And so even though um, this person or the student didn't necessarily have policy like a policy background, there was still a lot of stuff that they could draw on from their prior like lab or research experiences that could then transfer over to doing um, policy work. So you can think about what those transferable skills are um, in order to uh, apply for the jobs that you are interested in. And then if you don't have those skills, how can you get them? I know that um, LinkedIn Learning, um, Coursera, uh, lynda.com are some of the really common examples of uh, free online um, videos and uh, MOOCs that students can use in order to start teaching themselves some of the skills. Um, so this can be especially helpful for things if you're, say, interested in breaking into like a coding field or um, an industry where you need to know like coding um, in order to be successful. You can definitely find um, free online resources to teach yourself that. Um, same thing if you're interested in moving to like the business uh, side of things and you need to have like some prerequisite like business knowledge like accounting, um, finance, marketing, there are a lot of courses online that can teach you that as well. So you can also think about, you know, if you don't have those skills, what are some ways you can get them through free um, resources. Another thing that you um, you should consider is whether you'll need to pursue continuing or further education beyond your bachelor's degree. So this kind of goes in line with um, what some of the assessments on the previous slide talked about in terms of um, uh, ONET or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you'll find that maybe some of the careers that you're interested in require like a master's degree or a terminal degree of some sorts. Um, and so sometimes it might be helpful for someone who is not originally starting at that uh, career path with their bachelor's degree, it may be useful to pursue continuing education such as a master's degree um, in order to demonstrate that you have the requisite knowledge in order to be successful with that. I know that graduate school in and of itself is a very big investment. Um, and so we do have future panels um, hosted by the University Career Center about uh, the whole graduate school search process. So be sure to check us um, out at those workshops as well. But um, just as um, to kind of wrap up this point, um, education does and can happen outside of the classroom. So you can also think about ways that you can get experiential knowledge that necessarily doesn't take place outside of the classroom. So again, this can include things like internships, co-ops, um, volunteer opportunities. Those are all um, forms of experiential education that can then build on the skills you might need to be successful in a career outside of your major. And the last thing that you could consider is networking. So for those of you who are maybe not sure what it's like to break into a certain career that you are interested in, I think networking can be a really great way for you to get that firsthand knowledge from someone who is um, an expert or who does have that experience to talk about that can provide you some insight as to what you could be doing at this moment to set yourself up for success in your desired career path. Um, we've done previous workshops here at the Career Center about networking and mentoring which are also available at our um, YouTube channel at the UMD Career Center. So be sure to check that out. But as a general overview, um, some of the tools that I recommend to students to check out in order to get their networking game started is definitely LinkedIn. I know that LinkedIn can be an intimidating environment for some folks uh, to start networking, but it is a great place to start your search to at least identify some people who hold the job titles that you might want to have in the future or for folks who um, our alumni from the University of Maryland and would be willing to speak to you because they have like the same major as you. So those are, um, LinkedIn can be a good place to start, specifically Terrapins Connect, which is the online alumni platform hosted by the UMD Alumni Association, can provide you a more narrow look at specifically at UMD alumni. Um, it functions very similarly to LinkedIn in the sense that you can identify alumni based on what sort of careers they had, what sort of, um, you know, jobs that they've held in the past, what they studied, um, what they might have been involved with while they're at UMD. So those are definitely some things that you can um, 
those platforms are some things that you can look at initially to find people who can uh, speak to you about what they did in order to be successful in their career. And then from there, you can start to think about, okay, do I need to pursue additional education? Um, you know, what are some ways I could learn the skills that they said I needed to be successful? So networking can serve as that uh, vantage point for you. All right, so from here, um, Rachel will take over the rest of the presentation. And first, she'll be going over some alumni profiles of people who have had careers outside of a traditional um, STEM pathway. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, like he said, you know, we have some we have two profiles first, and then we actually have um, some alumni that are going to be here with us in real time and be able to talk about their experiences, too. Um, the two people you were about to see um, were not able to meet with us at this date and time. And so I asked them a few questions through email and they shared some information, some of which is on the slide and some of which, which I will read for you as well. Um, the first is Sarah Ann. She's a foreign service officer at the US State Department. Um, she's worked at embassies overseas to advance US policy and represent the people of the United States um, to other countries. She is currently stationed at the US Embassy in Guatemala City, um, where she told me she's covering human rights issues, including human trafficking, religious freedom, and gen uh, gender equality. Um, she's been in this role um, with the State Department for one and a half years. Um, I asked her to briefly describe what she does in her current position. And she says that her job is to talk to people in Guatemala about these topics towards trusting relationships and identify ways to collaborate internationally. More broadly, diplomats work on a wide range of issues, including international health, environmental protection, energy policy, and more in almost every country in the world. When I asked how she found out about this career path, uh, she said that at UMD, she participated in the Global Fellows Science Diplomacy Program, where she learned about the State Department's science engagement. She went on to intern at the State Department's Office of International Health and Biodefense in Washington, DC, and then in Malawi, um, where she helped evaluate grants for HIV AIDS prevention programs. She was inspired by the work of the diplomats who are often on the front lines of strengthening global science-based policies. And she said after her internship, she knew this was a career she wanted to pursue. I asked her about other roles that she thought students um, other roles that she's had that she thought maybe students would be interested in hearing about or key parts of her career path that were important to mention. Um, she said that after college, she taught English in Indonesia with the Fulbright program. Uh, she was awarded a State Department, um, I think it's Rangel um, Fellowship, which supported her graduate studies and prepared her for a career as a diplomat. She also interned at a range of DC-based organizations, including the House of Representatives, Center for Global Development and American Enterprise Institute, which gave her a better understanding of how she could apply knowledge from her biology degree to the field of public policy and international relations. And so as you can see from this slide too, she also listed her LinkedIn. Um, so if she is someone that sounds interesting to you, she is open to you connecting with her. Um, I can even I'm thinking about it, I can copy it and even put it into the chat. That's easier than trying to type it out right now. So if anyone's interested in reaching out with her, you have her link to her LinkedIn in the chat as well. And Jeffrey, could you go to our next one? All right, Alexa. Alexa is an account supervisor um, in specifically in client services at 21 Grams. Um, 21 Grams is a um, pharmaceutical agency. She serves as the liaison between the client and the creative team. Um, at 21 Grams, they create an array of advertisements for various pharmaceutical companies to promote their drug products, as well as sometimes just promoting the company itself. Um, and looking at the additional information that she gave me, she's been in client service, services for three and a half years. Um, one year at her current agency and three months with her current position title. Um, when I asked her to describe her positions, she says advertisements include commercials, print brochures, waiting room brochures, um, direct mail, emails, web banners, websites, videos, conference booths, peer-to-peer -peer education materials. She said the agency has five main 
career areas, art, um, which of course is the responsible for laying out of the materials, um, sometimes an opportunity to create scientific videos showing how drugs work, um, copy, so all the written material for the ads, fact checking to ensure accuracy, um, some agencies might specifically hire medical write writers for, for more high science products, she says. Project management, responsible for creating timelines, managing the team and ensuring deliverables are met on time. Um, account, um, responsible for interfacing with the client, typically the pharmaceutical company, ensuring they have what they want and need. Um, and then strategy is the last one, responsible for ensuring that all messaging is true to the brand and helping to create campaigns for each brand um, such as an email marketing campaign or entire messaging campaign. Um, I asked her how she found out about this career path. A friend of her parents works in the industry and at the time she was unsure of what she wanted to do. She spoke to this family friend and it seemed like a great industry to combine her love of science and for people into one job. Um, she applied for an internship and then eventually got a full-time um, post-graduation with that same organization. Other roles or important things that she thinks um, students should know about. Um, she wrote in all letters with exclamation points, internships. She said all the big agencies offer internships and most are paid. So that's a great way to get into the industry and to make um, contacts. And like Sarah Ann, I will um, put Alexa's um, link in the chat. But she's also open and willing to connect um, with any of you on LinkedIn. The one thing I will say, if you reach out to either of these, um, you know, when you request to connect, um, I harp on this a lot. So if you've ever seen me talk about LinkedIn before, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again. Always add a note. In this case, it would be great for you to be able to say, I saw your profile in, you know, this event that Maryland's doing, or you could specifically say careers, um, you know, alternative careers with the science degree. Um, but letting her know why you're reaching out will make it easier to start a conversation. So feel free if you reach out to either of these to let them know that it's, you're reaching out because they've basically already given you permission to reach out through this program. All right. So now we're gonna get to less of hearing from Jeffrey and I and hearing from our guests, our alumni, they're gonna share um, their experiences. Our guests are Shruti, Adam, and Ji, Ji Young. Um, I'm gonna start with Shruti just because alphabetically by last name, I put her there first. Um, <laughs> so hopefully she's okay with that. Hi, how are you? How are you? Can you hear good, me okay? Good. I can, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone can. Um, all right, so I know I give you a little bit of heads up on some of these questions, um, but if you would um, introduce yourself, what is your current position title? What organization do you work for? And how long have you been in that role? Sure. So I am an associate bioinformatics programmer at the MS Corporation. And I have been in my role for about a little bit more than a year and a half now. And yeah, I think that answers those questions. <laughs> Great. And actually, Jeffrey, can we stop sharing the screen just for now so that way we can see our panelists while we're talking to them? Thanks. All right. Uh, my next question. Um, would you briefly describe what you do in your current position? Yeah, sure. So as Essentially, my company contracts with various government and pharmaceutical entities, including NAID and uh, MetaMune and other such pharma companies. And we run phase one through three clinical trials. And my specific role includes analyzing metabolomic, lipidomic, transcriptomic, any big data science type data set from these clinical trials. So essentially you'll have, for example, three drug groups and four or five different time points and you're following immune response, let's say, um, between those three drug groups. And you're essentially using codes such as Python, Perl, R, various statistical programs to figure out which genes or which metabolites are over underexpressed in one of these study groups. Um, all of them are clinical trials. And yeah, we work with a variety of different statistical software, um, 
programming languages. And hopefully that gives an idea. Yeah, and how did you find out about this career path? Yeah, so I first started off essentially taking my MCAT, but also taking a gap year where I did some scribing and as well as clinical research. And within the clinical research component, I was working within medical devices for a company called Co-op Tech. And I really liked that aspect more than I thought I would, um, learning the statistics, learning the programming component, and then decided to pursue a master's in bioinformatics um, just because that kind of correlated with the direction of clinical research that I enjoyed and got my master's and did a few different internships at Georgetown University, which is where I also got my master's degree. And essentially after those internships started at my current position. Great. Um, what are other, I mean, you talked a little bit about some of them, but um, what other roles might you have considered that you think maybe students should know about? Or um, are there any key parts of your career path that have been important to you um, and to getting where you are? Yeah. Um, so I guess a big portion of getting to where I am now is not only the master's degree, but just getting out there in terms of trying out different career paths. For example, while I was at University of Maryland, I actually did a health policy internship. And then I also worked as a scribe. And um, I didn't do these things for large periods of time. It wasn't something that I did for all four years, but it was something that I wanted to get my foot in the door in different arenas, just because I knew that I wasn't 100% sure on going to medical school. So from there, just trying out different internships um, really kind of honed in the fact that I do like clinical research. I like working with um, that big data and statistics was something that I was interested in as well. And yeah, so I guess that kind of answers that question. Um, I know a lot of online courses from Coursera, Harvard, EDX, uh, those type of mini courses, some of which are free, really help too in terms of, I didn't get a computer science degree from University of Maryland. So resources like that really, I guess, improved my resume, as well as just was a really great foundation. Um, Great. Um, thank you so much. So we're going to let you step out of the hot seat for just a moment. Um, but if anybody has questions for any of the three that are going to talk to you, feel free. You can put them in the chat. We will kind of have some time at the end to maybe ask all of them questions. Um, but you will get a little break for now. And I'm going to move to Adam. <laughs> all righty. Hi, Adam. How are you? Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks. So if you would, please introduce yourself. Um, let us know your position title, um, what organization you're working with right now, and maybe how long you've been in that role. Sure. Uh, my name is Adam Hussein. I graduated from the University of Maryland in 2016 with a biochemistry degree. I graduated from Howard University with a doctorate of pharmacy last May. And currently, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in regulatory affairs with Vertex Pharmaceuticals. And I've been here in this position since July. Awesome. Now, would you please briefly describe what you do in your current position? So uh, regulatory affairs um, essentially boils down to working with uh, drug development in order to create and submit uh, dossiers and documentation to apply for new drug applications. So my company, he is very big on cystic fibrosis uh, drug pipeline. So that's what they mostly focus on. So as a PharmD fellow, I get to rotate different subfunctions of regulatory affairs. So that can include drug labeling, advertising and promotion, regulatory strategy. So I'm able to, it's a two year postdoctoral fellowship that's funded through Northeastern University. So I also have teaching responsibilities at Northeastern. And the goal is when I graduate or graduate from the program, 
to uh, be retained by my company, hopefully, in a high level manager managerial position in regulatory affairs. Very cool. Um, how did you find out about this career path? Uh, so uh, in pharmacy school, the conventional career path we learned about a lot was, um, you know, working behind a uh, grocery store counter or a CVS pharmacy, for example. We had uh, some speakers come from the FDA who are pharmacists to get to learn more about regulatory affairs in that regard. And uh, we had speakers come to our school similar to this kind of program, like a round table of different pharmaceutical careers where I got to learn about a PharmD fellowship and how that works and what a what a pharmaceutical industry pharmacist is. Awesome, great. See, career panels are, are here to stay, not just uh, at the undergrad, <laughs> that's good. Um, what are some other roles that you've had or key parts of your career path um, that really helped to get you where you are, in your opinion? Well, so uh, since Graduating high school, I worked in a pharmacy at some, like all the time I worked in pharmacy during, during the school year, throughout undergrad and pharmacy school. <laughs> during my time in undergrad and pharmacy school, I was involved in resident life. So as an RA and then as a GA when I was in graduate school. So that helped me with not necessarily like the pharmacy skills, but managerial skills, time management, people skills. Uh, other career options for pharmacists, they're honestly endless. Uh, I know I have a friend doing something similar to what Shruti is doing in a informatics uh, specialty. Most people would go on to work in a retail pharmacy or as a clinical pharmacist in a hospital, but there are just many career paths and I wanted to pursue the one I was most interested in. Awesome. And so this next question, the answer may be no based on you're saying you've worked in a pharmacy since high school, but are there other career paths that you considered? Or you don't always know that pharmacy was the way to uh, go. No, I mean, I, did, I definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, when I was an undergrad, I was pre-med. I was pre-med all the way up until I took my MCAT. And then I, I walked out of the MCAT and decided, you know what, I don't want to do this. So I had to pivot very quickly, like very quickly. I had to take a community college class up some of the pharmacy prereqs. I was able to graduate on time and apply on time. So it worked out for me. Uh, but even in pharmacy school, I was always struggling with what I wanted to do. I was really focused on clinical residency all the way up until, again, my last year. I was seeing a pattern here in retrospect. My last <laughs> year, I ended up realizing like, you know what, I don't want to do this clinical track either. Uh, so I got to explore the regulatory industry options and I was fortunate to apply for the, and get this position during my fourth year. So it was highly competitive. People really want to be involved in pharmaceutical industry and it's a growing field. Great, thank you so much. All right, you get to take a break for a moment now too. <laughs> All righty. Chiang, you are on deck. So these questions will be a, a little different because I'm not talking yeah. about the position that you're currently in um, and those watching will we'll see in a moment. But um, Tell the group a little bit about the, the career path that you are pursuing um, at the moment and what steps you're taking towards that. So um, I graduated in 2016. So I actually know Adam, so hello. But um, I was a bio major. I was pre-med up until senior year. Um, so all those years I was you know intent on applying to medical school, but I changed my mind because I thought more about the clinical aspect of being a physician and the more I thought about it, even though I love medicine so much, like I wasn't really sure about that. So my friend actually told me about medical illustration. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know it existed. Um, and I've always been really passionate about art, drawing, painting, and also medicine. So I was like, oh my gosh, like I need to look into this. Um, so I graduated and then I've been working on um, my portfolio and attending a private art atelier. It's basically like a studio. It's like an art school where you're not having lectures and exams. You're just in the studio all day, every day. Um, and it's a small one. So I had like 15 classmates and I officially um, applied last cycle for 
my medical illustration program. So it's a master's at um, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. So I'll be starting in the fall. But I guess I came on today because there's a lot more to say about the process of applying and how to get into it rather. But I also know about, you know, what medical illustrators end up doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think you might have already covered this. Um, you found out about the career from a friend, right? The career path from a friend? Yeah. How did she know about it? Is she in that path or did she hear from someone at some point or? Um, no, so we were actually, um, I don't know, we were actually CAs, like community assistants mm -hmm. at our dorm desks and she helped she was just on a like a news like a newsletter thing for bio majors and she she just saw it and then told me about it because I had been doing all the art for our um like our lobby and, <laughs> and so she just said it kind of jokingly like oh you should do this like screw med school but um and I actually got interested so I changed my mind and I went in for it and it's it is a great it's like a huge blessing that I found out about it because I'm really happy and I think that it's most it's I think not even just University of Maryland but other schools it's such a lesser known career path like there's literally only like 2,000 medical illustrators like in the world that are qualified um you can become one without a master's but nowadays companies and freelance people who want freelance work done they they ask that the person has a master's and there's only four schools in the united states that give out this master's and johns hopkins was the first one so i remember from our conversation it was a year ago maybe um yeah. that you had talked about how you know it's and you've even said now that it's not really well known and that you had to do a lot of your own research what did you find out from doing some of that research? Um, what are some of the things that you did, um, you know, beyond, you know, you already had your degree from Maryland. What are the, some of those extra things that you did because of the research that you found out that helped set you up for success? So fortunately, all the prerequisites, you don't have to be a bio major. You don't have to be a chem major. You can be an English major as long as you fill out all the prerequisites for each school. And luckily they have pretty much the same prerequisites. Um, so I just continued and finished my degree. And the best way to have, the best way to do research for medical illustration, if you're interested in it, is to contact the schools and call them. And um, Hopkins in particular is very open about posting their alumni since there's only seven per class. And so I would literally find them on LinkedIn and Facebook and, you know, type, hi, like I'm interested, would you mind asking some, answering some questions that I have about the process of applying? And um, it kind of, I guess I passed, it passed down because I had, there were students at my um, art atelier that came in just to prepare for their portfolio to apply for Hopkins. And I would be the one like helping them out, like telling them what to make and what not to make. But yes, contacting students is, sadly the only way to figure out more on how to apply. Gotcha. Um, before you found medical illustration, I know you talked about med school, were there other career paths that you considered? Um, I considered PA school for a bit, but I was pretty hard set on medical school just because, I mean, my passion for medicine I loved it so much but it was the clinical part that was making me doubt it a lot so finding this you know I'm so passionate about art and then medicine I really felt like I even put it in my personal statement that like I felt like it was made for me <laughs> but I did not medical school was pretty much the only thing I had on my mind cool um last question is that overarching one are there experiences or roles that you felt um, helped to um, lead to you to find this? I mean, I would argue being a CA did since it was your friendship with someone you worked with that kind of helped you find it.
But um, are there some other roles that you think really helped to prepare you or set you on your path? Um, I would say, in, do you mean like in terms of applying, like preparing to? Sure. What? Anything that you feel like has um, helped get you to where you are or, you know, things that you think those um, watching today should know about. So definitely, I would say in touch with alumni, um, student, like it's very easy to get in contact. You can just call the schools and ask for their list. Like they're not secretive about it. And the most important thing for medical illustration is it's sad, but no matter how passionate you are about it, no matter how interested you are, even if you have like a 4.0, if you cannot draw, I'm sad, I'm sorry, but you can't be a medical illustrator, but um doing your best to improve your art skills. If you know you have them as a foundation, and you want to improve them. Um, working on your, so applying to medical illustration programs, um, it is, it's a little different from med school and dental school, farm, you know, pharmacy school, all that. It takes about, it took me about half a year to prepare the portfolio. So each school's, fortunately each school's are like, like what they need from you is almost the same, you know, like five figure drawings, like five landscape paintings, like five, you know, and so it's about 22 pieces of art. So it took me about probably five months. So I would say like get ahead and get started and ask for as much advice as possible. Don't just, you know, don't just work in this in your studio by yourself thinking like, oh, you're fine. But, oh, I'm doing fine. Like if I'm going to get in, I look great. If my stuff looks great, but you need to ask and ask people that, you know, will give you the accurate opinion. You know, they're not just going to say, oh my gosh, she looks great. Like you need a, you need someone who will say like, all right, this needs to be improved. But yes, the most important thing is to ask for advice the most you can. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. I will remove the spotlight so it's not just you um, being highlighted. Um, but now is the time. If, if you have questions for any of the three that joined us today, um, you can either unmute yourself and ask the question, or if you'd like to put it in the chat, we can do it that way too, whatever you feel most comfortable with. If you have questions for all of them or even just one of them. Oh, we have one. Um, do you feel as though you want to stay in your current position as a long-term career or are you going to use your positions to help you get a different job later down the line? And I'm assuming that any and all of you can answer that. So whoever wants to start. I can start. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I know that I mean, for now, at least I know that I want to be a medical illustrator for the rest of my career because it's not just, you know, sitting, it's not, now that it's, you know, 2021 and graphics and computer graphics are becoming so great and advanced, everything is pretty much digital now. And the amount of possible jobs you can do with a medical illustration master's is insane. Like I like wrote it down, let me see. Okay. Um, I mean, when you go to the dentist, the doctor's office, the illustration on the wall of teeth, like all the 3D animations you've been seeing on the news of the COVID virus, like we're the ones that make those. And, but that's not all, that's not the only thing that they do because things like subcellular processes are illustrated, attorneys in court cases use medical illustrations for personal injury cases, like medical textbooks are illustrated. There's just so much that they do. So um, hopefully I will. Right now, I'm interested in um, sitting in on surgeries and illustrating them for medical students. Um, I mean, my friend is for her thesis at Hopkins right now. She's doing, she's com creating computer-based media for teaching MRI physics for radiology re re residents at Hopkins. Um, there's just an infinite amount of jobs that you can do with the, with this one degree. So. So I can also jump in on that question too. I think for me, I see a lot of possibilities as well in large data science. And so I definitely want to stay in that field of informatics and data science in general, 
there is also a career path that if you want to transition into software engineering, eventually you can do that as well. Currently my position, I also help develop software pipelines and um, software packages so that researchers can kind of automate the process of analyzing their data as well. So there is also, you can venture into the software side as well, but I personally like the data analytics. I like the statistics. I like being able to kind of find the biomarkers and the data that kind of tell you which drugs are working and which aren't. Um, yeah. Great, and Adam, did you want to answer that too? Oh, sorry, I thought Shruti had jumped on to the next question. What, which question was it again? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. The one about um, do you feel as you'll want to stay in your current position as long term oh, okay. career or move on? Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great question. Uh, I think a little bit of both. Like, definitely for the foreseeable future, I plan on staying where I am, uh, moving up. Uh, I want to stay in pharma. The question is whether or not I want to stay exactly in the same function that I am because there are there are a lot uh, to look into like from the medical side and the business side so uh, my current plan is to you know work my way up and if I can make a lateral move in the future I will be you know waiting to see what I can do so it's going to depend on what the future holds for me. Great thanks um, Shruti do you want to did you know the career path you wanted before beginning your master's program? Yeah, so I was working with this company called Co-op Tech while they were doing their clinical trials. And so I had a little bit of hands-on experience working with um, back-end programming. We used Epic as our database for that. And essentially um, I was doing a little bit of programming to kind of pull relevant patients to not only enter into our study, but also follow them through those clinical trials. And then from that research, I ended up finding out a little bit more about the informatics sector and then bioinformatics came from that. And so I did my bioinformatics degree at Georgetown University. Great, thanks. Um, another one for Ji Young, are there tools that you learned to use from your current position that you hadn't learned with your STEM education, what were you, um, what were you able to use these tools or how were you able to use these tools, excuse me? Um, so they, so when I was, when I, when I had graduated and I discovered that I wanted to do medical illustration, I had to do, um, well at my, Art Atelier, I basically, we are very strong on classical, like classical art. So I oil painted a lot. Like I should, I drew with charcoal a lot. Like I think, I truly think that learning classical art is the best way to prepare yourself for a medical illustrative, medical illustration degree, because it teaches you everything. Of, I'm getting into like, I'm getting a lot into art here. I'm sorry. So I'll talk about, I'll talk to like people personally if they want but um I did take a a, a little um class at MICA for Adobe Illustrator because since medical illustration is becoming so strong in digital art I don't really know about people that are doing traditional stuff still but Adobe learning Adobe Illustrator being strong in the all the Adobe programs Photoshop Illustrator um, I'm blanking on the other ones that definitely helps and it helped me with my portfolio because there were parts of the portfolio they ask for about five or six digital pieces so if you don't know how to use those it's going to be really hard so I highly recommend learning and getting familiar with those programs and then if there's another question for me <laughs> Yeah, I was like, you don't have to necessarily um, apologize about the art piece because I did actually, there should be some art students um, on this because I advertised it with my colleague who works in arts and humanities. So there probably are a few oh, okay. art students that are interested in what you're saying too. Plus, if we have science students that are interested in it, they're gonna need to know the art piece, right? Yeah, um, so for art, I highly, high, again, like I highly, highly recommend, I did take one art class at Maryland when I was a freshman and it was, 
nothing against the the teacher or the class, but it just was not helpful for a medical illustration portfolio because they are, because if you think of, I mean, if you think of on TV, the, the little 3D animations of the COVID virus you guys have been seeing, like that is extremely just basically like it's for perfectionists, the details, the lighting, the coloring, the, the shapes, like everything is, we're very, um, like we, we take it really seriously that it has to be like down to like the per like literally the cell it needs to be perfect so um I would really be I really wouldn't like be, I wouldn't take a class that is abstract because that's not and that just does not help in medical illustration that's just more like to us like that's for fun um but I can link you guys to the school that I went to um, and I know that it's really hard right now because our portfolio requires figure drawing, portrait drawing. And fortunately, I applied last cycle. I just deferred a year. Um, so I already finished. But I know that schools are being understanding and sympathetic about figure drawings because you can't be in a room with someone for four hours. That's how long they take, you know, and because it's just not safe right now. Um, Wow, a lot of questions. Okay, um, is there any way we can contact you? Yes, I am totally, totally happy to talk to you guys. I just, I when I was applying and when I was trying to figure out how to learn any information on about Hopkins, about University of Chicago, like it was just very hard. So my email is my first name, jiyoung.oh at gmail.com. Like that is the best way to contact me. And then you can, I'll give you my phone number and we can call. Um, and then let me see. For young, what type of pieces consist of a strong portfolio and was it mostly digital? So if you go to the websites, you can just Google Johns Hopkins um, School of Medicine, Art as Applied to Medicine. Um, all the four schools tell you what, what they want in their portfolio. And if, I'm just gonna pull up my documents of portfolios, but they are mostly the same. It's about 20 pieces of art. Um, I think only five of the, uh, five of the pieces were digital for me. Um, the, the rest of it is like, I'm pulling it up right now. <laughs> so I have about five figure drawings five just regular drawings, a few oil paintings. And then I have like charcoal drawings. I have sketches on just paper. I have, and then I have about five digital pieces. So yes, um, for digital pieces, I strongly recommend being, um, I, for me, I use an iPad Pro, I have one, and then I use Procreate, and I strongly, strongly recommend using an Apple Pencil. Like I thought, like that basically made my, that's the reason I, my digital pieces were good enough for them. Um, but it's not mostly digital, and I'm happy to help you guys, you know, decide on what, what makes your portfolio strong. And were you already proficient in art when you decided to go down this path or were you more bio? Um, I was more, at the time I was more biology and med school oriented because I wasn't, I hadn't been, you know, drawing for a long time, but I've, my whole life, I've always been drawing and painting in free time um, just because it runs in the family. My dad is very good at art, but um, I, during school, I wasn't really painting or drawing. I didn't have time, but after this, I got, I really got back into it. So yes, I have had art skills before this, but my private art atelier definitely helped, helped more. Great, and Shruti, um, someone said that they're a biology major, but are not too familiar with computer science. Um, what are some programs, courses that you would recommend to create a foundation for data science? Yeah, so I mostly started the computer science portion of my training at Georgetown, but in addition to that, I did do some Harvard EDX courses on um, R, some on Perl, um, 
there's a ton of Coursera courses on that as well that I hear are really great. And honestly, doing a simple Google search is how I find a lot of my courses. I will say, I see like another question, so I'm down here too. So I'll just answer that as well. So I don't feel as too disadvantaged, um, especially with the comp sci degree. We have interviewed people with computer science degrees that didn't get the position because they don't have the biology background. Biology is very, it's almost a different language. And it's, it's a little bit harder to learn if you don't understand the biochemistry and like for example, next generation sequencing, you can understand how generally a computer works and how a computer thinks and logics, but you know, those tiny parts of how DNA binds or how immunoglobulins work, things like that to kind of make sense of the data, um, it's very important. So we have had people who have interviewed for a similar position without the biology background and they didn't get it versus the opposite, we do a lot of hands-on training in terms of computer science. So not too much of a disadvantage and there are plenty of courses out there. Um, Google and Facebook have removed their college degree requirement for computer science. So, you know, there's plenty of online resources that you can take. Um, so, oh. Go ahead. Were you gonna answer the next okay, one? So yeah, um, at the undergrad level, do you believe it is? A, um, I was never, I never had an art minor and there's no problem with that. They do not expect that you had it, that you majored in it um, in terms of logistics or you know, just your application details. It, you don't have to have a art degree. You can be, just like I said, you can be an English major as long as you have all the prerequisites and a portfolio that they really like, you'll be fine. Great. Any final questions? All right, well, I'll give another, people another moment in case they do. But in the meantime, I'm gonna share my screen just to show um, my contact information as well as Jeffrey's. So if anyone has any additional questions for us, or maybe you're interested in an alternative career, but not one um, that we talked about today, um, you could reach out to us if you, you know, are looking for ways to connect with people or find out about these things. Um, that is certainly an option as well. The recording, yes, the recording will be on the center's YouTube page. So UMD Career Center. Um, if you have trouble finding it, please feel free to shoot me an email, um, but it should be up later tonight or tomorrow. And then the only other thing I'm sticking in the chat before everybody disappears, if you were late joining, I'm going to put a link to the kiosk link really quick, just to kind of sign in and see that you joined us today. I have to scroll up and find it so I can share it with those that might have been coming late.